Well, let's get started and uh, people can continue to tr trickle in. Um, and uh, here we are. Welcome to the 20th annual Brattleboro Literary Festival. I'm Tim Weed, a locally based writer and volunteer for the festival's uh, author committee. It is a great honor for me today to present two wonderful novelists, Sabina Murray and Dario Suarez. Um, and the plan is to introduce the two of them first in their latest books. Uh, by the way, you can order uh, Dario and Sabina's books um, even while we're talking by linking, uh, by you know, clicking on the link that's going to be appearing in the chat. And then we'll all go back, uh, sit back and, and listen to um, a sample reading from each of them. And they're gonna go back and forth a little bit and, and do a couple of readings, I think. Um, and then we will have a chance to uh, discuss their work, uh, the state of literature, writing, reading, whatever they and you want to discuss. Um, a reminder that you can submit questions via the Q&A button on your screen. If a version of your question has already been submitted, you can just click the thumbs up icon to upvote the question. Um, there will also be links again in the chat to purchase uh, Dariel and Sabina's books and to donate to the festival and a special thanks to, the, to our sponsors. Um, so as people continue to, to trickle in, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, and I'm going to introduce the two uh, writers first. And then, as I said, we'll, we'll sit back and have a little bit of a reading and a little bit of an organic discussion about whatever it is that uh, is on the agenda for today. So uh, one of our novelists today is Sabina Murray, grew up in Australia and the Philippines and is currently a member of the MFA faculty at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. She's actually uh, speaking to us tonight from Reykjavik, which is kind of cool. Sabina is the author of Tales of the New World, A Carnivore's Inquiry, Forgery, Valiant Gentleman, and The Caprices, which won the Penn Faulkner Award for Fiction. Her latest novel is The Human Zoo, which uh, Shelf Awareness says, sublimely transitions into a contemporary socio-political thriller enhanced with colonial legacy, cultural erasure, government corruption, and unreliable narrators, an exhilarating literary experience, and the Christian Science Monitor says, Sabina Murray's smart idea packed story grapples with corruption, identity and loyalty building to a searing climax. So really excited for that book. Um, Dario Suarez, our second novelist here, but well, they're not second, they're both here together, um, was born in Havana, Cuba and immigrated to the United States with his family in 1997. His debut story collection, A Kind of Solitude, received the 2017 Spokane Prize for Short Fiction and the 2019 International Latino Book Award for Best Collection of Short Stories. Dariel is an inaugural City of Boston Artist Fellow and Education Director at Grub Street. His first novel is The Playwright's House, which no less a luminary than Ha Jin calls a big hearted novel intricately embedded in the politics and daily life of contemporary Cuba it is also a, a, a family story of love, sibling rivalry, courage, and redemption. Suarez writes with energy, exuberance, and psychological acuity. A straightforward prose adds gravity and earnestness to this remarkable novel. And the LA Review of Books says, the narrative has a crispness, crispness, a rhythmic pace by turns deliberate and frantic, much life, like life on the island, yet the story never loses its momentum. So I, I I'm really excited to have both of you here and to have you in the audience here as well. And don't forget that you can um, uh, type in your questions as we go into the Q&A. We'll make sure that we, we uh, have time at the end to address those questions. Um, so I think we're going to start uh, with Sabina. Turn it over to you. Ah, OK, hi, everyone. <laughs> Thank you for. Um coming out to your computers tonight <laughs> to support me and Daryl. Um, so what I thought I would do is I would just read a very short piece. It's just an intro. This is, this is my book, The Human Zoo, and it's set in Manila. And it's set kind of in the current, in the present time um, where the country is kind of uh, in the grips of a dictatorship, which is kind of, you know, it's going to be interesting talking to Dariel about these different, these different movements through the work. Um, 
So I'm just going to read a very short bit. It's just about a page, a couple of minutes, just to get warmed up. And then Daryl's going to read something. We're going to talk a little. And then I'll, I'll read something that I guess is more in the plot part of the story. This is just from the beginning. My character, uh, Ting, is uh, she's Filipino-American, so Phil M, sort of, but grew up in the Philippines. And it's mixed race and is going back um, she's had a relationship fall apart and she kind of wants to hide out with her titas, her aunts um, in the place where she grew up. So this is just from the near the beginning. Nearly a year had passed since I had last visited Manila. I had been on assignment from Vice covering newly sworn in president Procopio Copo Gumbok who had swept the elections in an upset and was now governing the nation in state run terror. Under his rule, police had carte blanche to execute anyone suspected of dealing or using drugs, mostly shabu, a form of crack cocaine. The police had been embraced by, the policy had been embraced by a corrupt police force whose officers were gunning down anyone they felt like. I wondered if this girl knew if she was aware that close to 10,000 people had lost their lives. And this scene thing is in a cab with an American girl who she's helping to her hotel from the airport. Vice had sent me to explain why, despite the killings, the president's popularity rating had held at an astounding 80%. I had set up interviews with people that I found interesting college age socialists, a radical nun who had been active when the former dictator Batak was ousted in the eighties, a community leader whose neighborhood of Mandaluyong had lost many lives. Vice ran it as a centerpiece to an issue on populism. Since then, Gumbok had managed to insult an assortment of people that included the president of the United States and an Australian nun who had improbably inspired his sexual fantasies. As I wrote the article, I felt as if I were inventing things, but it was all verifiable and what it appeared fact-checked as if reality were something that earned its name through verification rather than by just being real. Barreling along the night streets, the taxi wrapped in an aqueous blanket, the driver constantly clearing the tiny porthole through the fogged windscreen amid the thump and screech of the faulty wipers. It was hard to feel that I was in anything but a dream. Um, yeah, so I just, I wanted to open with that, that short little bit also because, and this is, you know, I think it's an, an interesting way to start the start a conversation with Daryl um, because I actually did I personally went to Manila and was paid by Vice to write an article on why President, not Gumbok, Gumbok's my name for the guy, Duterte was so popular in the Philippines. So I think that's funny. So that's like something that I'm really gonna wanna pick up with Daryl later is just like what the role of reality is in this stuff. So now I'm gonna be quiet and I'm, I'm really excited to hear my friend Daryl read now. So go. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Sabina. I have many questions, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait until we get into the conversation uh, portion of this. Um, thank you, Tim, for moderating. Thanks to the Brattleboro Literary Festival folks for hosting and to everybody who's attending. I'm just going to, much like Sabina, I'm going to read a very short excerpt from the Playwrights House. Um, and I'm also going to do something similar. I'm going to read something from sort of early in the book, and it's mostly sort of context, uh, backstory, um, and, and in some ways historical context, uh, something that happened in the 80s in Cuba. Um, so I'm going to do that first. And if we get a chance to read later, I'll read more about, about, about the characters. But essentially, this is a book about two strange brothers whose father is a famous Cuban theater director. And um, he gets arrested for what seem to be political reasons. And then the main character, who's the older brother, Sergei, a lawyer, has to decide how much he wants to risk his career and eventually his life to, to sort of find out what's happening with his father and whether or not he can help him uh, get out of prison. So again, I'm just gonna read a very short excerpt. I don't think it needs much of an introduction. It's mostly just historical context. Um, and it's also about a page long. In June of in 1989, perplexing news stopped the country in its tracks. Cuba's highest decorated soldier and certified hero of the revolution, General Arnaldo Ochoa Sanchez, have been accused of, among, among other acts, treason. 
During a televised military honor court and subsequent trial, something rare in Cuba where serious governmental matters were usually dealt with behind closed doors, a docile, bespectacled Ochoa humbly declared that the accusations made against him, drug trafficking with the Medellin cartel, illegal arms and sugar trade with Angola, diamonds and ivory smuggling were all true. With a slump head and childlike aspect in his stare, he said in a soft, defeated voice, some speculated that he had been drugged by Castro's people during the entire proceedings, that he couldn't explain exactly why he had betrayed his country. While trying to acquire arms to strengthen the Cuban military, he explained, one thing regrettably led to another. The one biting assertion Ochoa made was that some of the other men suspected of involvement, as well as witnesses who had testified, including senior officers in the Ministry of the Armed Forces and Ministry of the Interior, had distorted the facts in order to save themselves. On July 13th, after being found guilty, his sentence ratified by a council of state led by Fidel Castro, Ochoa and three other officers were executed by a firing squad. Fidel went as far as to publicly call some of the men, quote, sons of bitches, for involving his brother Raul in their statements and claiming that there had been mitigating circumstances. Ochoa's body was dumped in an unmarked grave in Havana's historic Cristobal Colon Cemetery. Hordes of top officials, heads of police, immigration, and counterintelligence officers were fired or demoted. A few other people went to prison. The Castros cleaned house. Numerous rumors dispersed among the population, though no one ventured to state them openly. One alleged that the Castro's, the Castro's top-notch counterintelligence unit had to know what Ochoa was up to from the start. Another said that Raul, who had been close friends with a well-liked general for decades, saw him as an adversary for succeeding Fidel, so he tapped Ochoa head of the Western Army in order to conduct a background check that coincidentally revealed the general's crimes. The most popular rumor went like this. Fidel had discovered plans of a potential military coup by Ochoa and his men, and without wasting time, he put on a theatrical display for all to see. Whatever the truth, one thing was clear. Regardless of who you were, you did not fuck with the Castros. And I'll, I'll stop there. Great, and I think, um, so I, I wanna throw it back over to Sabina because I think Sabina, you, you may have a question based on that and maybe, and then you can maybe do it or I don't, however you guys wanna do it. I'll throw it back to Sabina. Yeah, well, it's just a, a conversation that, you know, if I'm in a room with, a virtual room with a writer like um, Dariel, I, I, I'm just curious, like with all of this political history, you know, why, what makes you want to write a novel about it when you have all of, I mean, you know, I just remember being, I was at dinner with a very famous writer once and I was working on a historical book and she had a beef with me, which had nothing to do with me, which is a fun story, but you know, for another time. But anyway, she said to me, oh, darling, why are you writing a book about why are you writing a novel about this guy, it's Roger Casement, when there are so many books already out there? And I just, I've been walking around that with that question for years, like, okay, so what, what kind of truth, what kind of truth does fiction do that, you know, why would I want to bring the truth of fiction to a political situation that there's lots of information out there? So I'm just going to throw that back at you, Dariel. What do you think? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, particularly if, yeah, as you said, if you're a writer who's interested in, in history or his, interested in politics, um, I think that for me, the simple answer from the perspective of the writer is freedom. It's the fact that I can take something that took place or something that intrigues me and that I can research, but that I can also turn into something else. And even though, you know, the excerpt I read, a lot of that is true. Um, and a lot of that did happen. Um, the way that I can use it in a novel it might be completely different than if I were just trying to stick to the facts or whatever took place or the history of a place or a people. So with fiction, you really can dig into the certain layers um, uh, using your imagination and using other characters and using context as something that informs a, a separate or maybe even more contemporary set of characters rather, rather than having to stick just with, with the history or the facts. Uh, which has a lot of power and there's a lot of 
you know, obviously nonfiction does a lot as well for, for a reader. But for me as a writer, that's, that's sort of the simple answer. And I think for the characters themselves, you know, the idea that through different characters, you can really dig into not just what actually happened in a place at a particular time, but you can look at the sort of micro consequences of that and, and the human impact of that in a way that maybe may feel more distant from the actual events. Um, but it, but it's not completely separate because you you were sort of part of that. And I, you know, with Ochoa, it's who's a real, who was a real yeah. general. I I grew up with those stories and um, and hearing my dad and other people in the family talking about them. So for me, yeah, I think just fiction gives you the freedom to really dig into certain areas of the human condition that you can, you know, in nonfiction to to, to some extent. But again, it's the freedom to move through time to to write a story that's more contemporary. Um, and, to, and to sort of find more distance from the actual events into a very intimate human lives. I think that's one of the beauties of fiction. So for me, it's, uh, yeah, it just feels like a natural place to go. Um, and something that I thought, and I want to throw back as Sabina, as you, mm-hmm. were, I believe the main character in your, in your novel, The Human Zoo, is, is a journalist. And, you know, and, and journalism is something that I, I grew up with. My dad was a journalist. And, um, and you know, people have described some of my short stories as having sort of journalistic, uh, journalistic tone, um, and it's something that I even in, in this book that I, you know, the, in the novel, I, I, it plays a part into it. And I'm curious, in your case, what your personal relationship is to journalism, because you mentioned having actually gone to interview and and do a piece, um, and then in your novel, you're using a journalist. And I'm I'm sort of similarly to your question in terms of why fiction versus nonfiction. I'm curious as to how journalism plays a part in both uh, this novel, but just your relationship to writing in general. Yeah, I think I ended up with um, the journalistic piece because I had never really, I'd written nonfiction, but when I did the piece for his vice in 2017, I had never been hired to do something as a journalist. So it ended up, there was a connection with some guy who was an editor at vice, who was looking for somebody to go into the Philippines and just write something about Duterte and ask me to pitch a couple of ideas. And I wanted to know why he was so popular. Like I knew why he was in power because people like that always end up in power. And there are crazy people and they like kill lots of people. I don't like it, but I, I could wrap my head around that. But what I couldn't wrap my head around was why it was so popular. Um, and then I went and I went and asked a bunch of people and I said, oh, I asked a bunch of people why he's so popular and this is what I found out. They said, yes, but but it doesn't say that in the New York Times. And I got really confused. I was like, why would you send me there if it was already said in the New York Times? Like then somebody else would have said it. You sent me there to find something new. It's like, yeah, but now we can't verify it. And then it did this thing to my head. I was like, oh my God, what is truth? What is truth and what is the truth that I'm trying to tell? So I think for me, like the challenge with that is like, what is the truth that fiction writers tell? What is the truth that journalists tell? And in in the, in the human zoo is full of journalists. There are three or four journalists in there and they all know a different truth and they're all right. So that was part of, part of what I wanted to do, but also just coming out of that experience of trying to you know, get people to care about Duterte and how, how he's subjugating people, how he's murdering people in the streets and how scared people are. And then, you know, I always end up with this quote that's the you know, quote from Stalin, of all people, that, you know, a million people is a statistic. You know, one, one, a million deaths is a statistic. One death is a tragedy. So what do we do as fiction writers? You know, you can actually do the one death. You can get somebody, get people to care about somebody who doesn't even exist. And you can break their hearts by making them feel for a person who is going through tragedy. It's very hard to do that with with reality. So that's kind of, you know, that's kind of how I ended up with the whole journalism aspect of it. Was just like, what does this mean? You know, it's very, it's very confusing. Question for both of you guys is so 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 following up on this, do you think um, that fiction, because I mean this this question of you know what what is truth and fiction versus nonfiction, do you think, I mean, are do you write fiction because you think it is is capable of getting at some kind of deeper truth or different truth than the actual truth? I mean, the actual truth meaning, you know, I mean, th- that's questionable too, but I mean, what do you think about that? Is fiction capable of getting at a deeper truth? Well, I think for, I think it, I mean, 
Just a short answer, then I'll expand later, but first, you know, just short, and then I'll listen to Daryl on this too. But for me, what I find, what I find interesting with fiction is how people learn stuff. And when people learn stuff through fiction, they remember it. And weirdly, it comes to stand in for the truth. So if I, you know, you ask people, and I always say this one, you know, if you ask people, what do you know about Victorian London? Chances are they're really informed by Dickens, either by actually reading his books or the kind of crazy stuff that's been handed down to us, either, you know, movies of Oliver Twist or crazy musicals or, you know, that's what you think of. Um, nobody would know anything about Regency England. I doubt that they would if, you know, there weren't so many people who love Jane Austen. And even when you ask people like, you know, what do they know about different countries or the culture, you know, South Africa, if it's somebody who lives in the US and doesn't have a real connection with that, it's gonna be like maybe Gordon could see you know, all of these different people. So fictionally defines how we best remember truth. I think it defines how we best remember truth. So if you learn it through a novel, chances are, even if you're not hundred percent sure if it's true, like, you know, is that possible? I changed the name of my characters. I changed Gumbok um, and Batak. I changed Marcos was Batak and then Duterte became Gumbok. And the reason I did that is because I didn't know what was going to happen. And also because these are very dangerous people who are, you know, going around making people's lives impossible. The descendants of Marcos are, you know, you don't know what these people are capable of. So I just thought, you know, you mess with it. Right. And then that does give you the freedom. So, Yeah. But, you know, regardless, people, that's the kind of, there are a lot, if people read this book, if American readers read this human zoo, chances are when they think of the Philippines and political situation, they will know the most about it from this novel. Dario, what do you think? Yeah, I think it's, you know, I, I think it depends on how one, how one looks at the word truth and what it actually means, because, you know, obviously some some people might sort of attach it to fact or, or real life or reality or um, something that happened or actually happened. But I think the reason why I do think fiction gets at, at, at many truths is that it is asking those, uh, you know, more layered, uh, nuanced questions. And then it's trying to get into those gray areas where you're looking at contradictions, where you're looking at different points of view, where you're looking at the reasons why something may have happened or why why something, why people do things, um, the impacts of that and all those layers that go beyond just the fact that something happened or, you know, in, in, in the case of something terrible, we can process and understand that, but, but until you really dig into the layers, into the impact, into the, the with that, the human lives more individually, as Sabina said, sort of the perspective of individuals in, in, the, in the case of fiction, usually characters, you, you can start to really understand more, you know, what that reality is or might have been. And, um, and I think that that's where, to me, the truth, what we think of as truth lies. It's complicated, it's layered, and it doesn't mean that, you're all, that we're all going to agree in, t you know, in terms of what the truth actually is. Um, but because you're looking at more sort of a, a broader and deeper sort of uh, perspective of an event or a people or a place, I think it allows you to get at, at, the, at the truth and the reality of it in a way that's um, just a lot more nuanced and, and, and in a way is a way to engage with history beyond just you know, the events that took place. Um, and, and that's why I'm so drawn to fiction, just because you, you know, you in the process, you even surprise yourself and in the places where you end up with your characters and the kinds of questions that come up for you. And I don't think that you're necessarily trying to find all the answers, but just trying to find what are the right questions to ask and, and to have a better understanding. I think it's just, uh, it's what I attach to truth. Maybe it's, it's understanding to some extent. Um, so anyway, yeah, that's sort of a long-winded rambling answer, but that's that's what comes to mind with, with the idea of truth and fiction. Um, I think it very much reveals uh, a lot of truths for us. This is really a fascinating conversation. Um, what I, I wondered, can we hear a little bit more of, or, or do you want to keep talking or, or Sabina, would you read, maybe read us a little bit more and then Dario? I'll read, I can read another short section that maybe, yeah, because also okay. a short one, um, the book, Part of the way that the book is structured, she's a journalist, she's also a nonfiction writer, um, and she's writing a book about um, the human zoos, which is where the book gets its name from. Um, and she's researching this, uh, this one, someone from the indigenous tribes in the, in the northern part of the Philippines who ended up being brought to the US. So I'll read a section of, from, from that. 
and she's basically, it's about somebody with writer's block and her writer's block is standing in for a whole bunch of other blocks she has going in her life. And so the character she's writing about is this guy, Timicheg. Timicheg and his tribe were not the first group of Igorots to make it to the United States. So they were brought to the United States, hired as a human zoo. Um, in 1904, a trial outing was funded by the US government to the tune of $1.5 million and brought 1,300 Igorots to be displayed at the St. Louis Exposition. It was a huge success. One and a half million sounds like a lot of money, but when one considered what was at stake, this was chicken feed. The annexation of the Philippines had not won universal approval, and it was in the best interest of those who supported the venture to demonstrate the Filipinos' inability to govern themselves. When after a stint in St. Louis, Hunt returned to Bontoc in 1905, he brought an enticing offer he would pay any willing Bontoc $15 a month in wages to travel to the United States and perform their most barbaric selves for a hungry American public. Though, of course, that could not have been how he sold the venture to them. Maybe he proposed that they would perform their dances, play their music, and present their culture to those lost in the ignorance of American isolation with the hope that the Americans would thrill to see the practices of the Bontoc as they had never seen anything like it. Maybe in the conjuring of their drums and graceful frightening dance, they could transport the American public to the vine choked gullies and miraculous rice terraces, to the softly chilled mountain air, to the sun striking rays over the ridge of mountains at dawn, to the rustle of a doe in the long grass and the shink of an arrow that brought that threw the warriors um, that brought her to her knees, and to the gory red of sunset that threw the warriors in silhouette as they came marching back from a successful outing against their foes. And the Bontoc had seen nothing like America and had never earned a wage. Why not go? There's a photograph of Truman Hunt's tribe at Coney Island, five years before Schneiderwin's Bontoc arrived. They are penned off like cattle, mostly naked, wearing loincloths fashioned from hand-woven, richly colored native cloth. Most are huddled around a fire. We see their backs. It must be cold because the white observers lounging on the railing are all in jackets and hats. One woman around the fire is bundling herself into a blanket. But the kicker in the photo is the Bontoc man who is pointing at the camera. He has singled out the photographer as his target humorously and seems to be saying, as he is a headhunter, your head next. Seated by the fire is his laughing compatriot holding a weapon, also anchored toward the photographer. They are making fun of the situation, the absurdity of it. They are getting paid and they think will soon be headed home. So that's just a little bit because they did. That's what they did. They brought all these, they went up to the mountains and they found these Filipino tribesmen and then they, they brought them to the St. Louis Exposition. And then they said to the Americans, we should really annex the Philippines because do you think that this person who we are paying, you know, whatever, this much money a month to eat a dog for you, which they didn't eat at home, but they had to eat for the American public. Do you really think they can govern themselves? So that's how the U.S. ended up annexing the Philippines. Anyway. I have a couple of craft questions, but again, I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna hold off. Uh, okay. Um, and um, so I'll read it just also another very short excerpt. Um, and then this one, uh, some of the main characters are just walking through the city, and and the main character Sergey sort of uh, meditating on his relationship to to Havana. They step beyond Lovers Park and further to the right, the monumental statue of Dominican-born General Maximo Gomez. The illustrious 10 years war and war of independence main strategist depicted on horseback was propped on a dozen columns in turn supported by a series of sculptures narrating some of his heroics. Sergei had been brought here on an elementary school field trip. Across from the park, he got to see El Castillo de la Punta. Together with El Morro, the Spanish built it to protect the entrance to the harbor. He also got to see the entrance to El Tunnel de La Habana. 
The tunnel left the biggest impression on him when his teacher, a sweet lady serendipitously named Dulce, indicated that the road dipped below the harbor and continued all the way underwater until it emerged behind El Morro. Sergei marveled at the ability of a man-made structure to withstand so much weight, his excitement amplified by the possibility that it could drown at any moment. A couple of years later, Felipe took, took him and Victor to El Morro. Sergei was already in secondary school. He could not remember flickering lights rolling by as the bus sped inside the tunnel, the echoing rumbles and swooshes of adjacent cars. He kept thinking about the sea above him, about the tunnel caving in and tons of water engulfing vehicle after vehicle. From El Morro, Felipe and the boys beheld the sprawling splendor that was Havana. The Malecón promenade curved away from them, graceful as a fine blade. Regardless of the physical desolation of so many neglected buildings, taken as a whole, Havana inspired awe. Felipe had described it once as an expansive cluster of varied architecture, unified by a lingering colonial aesthetic. At its core, the mystery was so abundant, he said, so overwhelming, that it transformed itself into something evocative and beautiful. A young Sergei had understood what his father meant, but he was more captivated by something else the vibrant blue of the water, the music of the waves lapping at the rocks below the fortress, like a bristled broom gently sweeping, the air emboldened by the height and open spaces. His senses were acutely stirred. It put him in a meditative trance as he observed Havana. He didn't think of history, the revolution, martyrs, what was inculcated at school. It was as if he were suddenly capable of simplifying everything, as if he were maturing in a moment spelled finding himself able to do what only grown men and women could do, willfully fall in love with his country. And I'll stop there. Both of those were just beautiful, really, really great little slices of those, of these wonderful novels. So I don't know, do you guys have more? I have, I have some questions for you, but I think you might, guys might have some questions for each other as well, right? I do. <laughs> Yeah, um, so I have I've sort of, you know, maybe maybe it's sort of a craft, crafty question simply because of the, the amount of details that you shared in, in, in your excerpt, Sabrina, and, and that makes me think of in the context of fiction or fictionalizing, you know, history, or, um, how do you go about selecting your details and how do you go about choosing what to include, not just in terms of what was true or, you know, or actually happened, but in terms of describing that, that, you know, that using that language that brings the reader in, that evokes all these details that we may not otherwise be able to see, uh, even if we learn them. So I'm curious as to, you know, how the process works for you in these passages where you're trying to select when to give us a metaphor, when to give us an adjective, when, when to describe something more specifically or linger on something rather than just stick into, you know, the things that actually happen. Yeah, it's, my problem is that I love research so much that I would just put, make that whole, what, what go on the page is one page. If I was not thinking in a craft oriented way, that would be like 40 pages because I just research so deeply. But then I really have to think the reason, the way that that got narrowed is I was just wondering what my character would be thinking of at that point in her life on the page. What of her tremendous research would she think about and what would that character think is compelling? So in that, I mean, just to be really like specific to that, she's thinking, what, what would the American public have found? What would the Buntalk have thought about themselves that the American public would find appealing or would give them pride? And so much of the book for me is tangling with this idea that the American public had no idea how proud the Bontoc were of their way of life and who they were. They didn't see themselves as barbarians. They saw the Americans as barbarians, right? It's always the other is the barbarian. And just this whole idea, you know, you're always scratching at that. You're always making an argument in your book. So my argument in this book is like, you can't just assume that a culture thinks they're inferior 
because you're the United States. In fact, no culture feels that way. That's like an insane way to feel. But so when I'm thinking about those details, that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to, you know, you're always trying to be on your little seductive mode. So that's kind of, um, that's kind of where I went with that section. Um, yeah. Uh, and I'm also curious just to kind of to throw the that question back at you, but also the role that um, family plays and family structures and family lore in creating these situations. Cause I think that's something that keep, that's gonna pop up in both of our books is like the history you read and the one that you were just drenched with sitting around the table on you know a Sunday afternoon and being like, what the heck that really happened? Those histories that we learn and how, how family history affects how you put your research and your craft together into this, this book. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think it kind of relates to what you were saying too about the the notion of uh, interrogating what a character might notice or might think. It's the idea of filtering things through the characters and and uh, use the word to to seduce, you know, uh, the reader. And I think that uh, when 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 we think of the way that we're infusing history and we're infusing, you know, and whether it's through the family, but but just in general as well. Um, that is something that I think I'm, I'm always consciously thinking about. It's like, what is the function of this information for lack of a better word? So, you know, the first excerpt I read, which is more historical in nature and it's sort of not even filtered too much through any character, even though it's technically filtered through the main character. Um, I'm trying to, I'm thinking about stakes and I'm thinking about, I need to show the reader what the main character is up against in terms of a system, in terms of like what, you know, if this famous Cuban general couldn't do anything, uh, what is what does he, a puny young lawyer, have? You know, in his side on his side in order to help his dad. So that's sort of like one sort of way in which you're thinking about all right, how does this work? Um, and then through family and family history, it's the way that you personalize all of these complex realities, right? Because you then not only have the interpersonal and the way that the, the generational differences are there exists. It, with a family and then the history that exists between their own traumas and their own, um, in, you know, sort of internal intimate history. But it's also how that kind of tends to echo or parallel what's happening outside of them, what's happening in the country, what's happening in the case of my book, Havana. And you're constantly interrogating as you're writing what perspective they're sort of each character has and why. What, it, what is it that is informing their reality? What is it that is informing their perspective? And it, this is why novels take so long to write and why they are so long and big, because I do feel like it's, it's an opportunity for us to really engage, not just through a singular perspective, but through a lot of them. And I think just family carries the weight of an entire country and an entire culture oftentimes, or it can to some extent. And it allows us to do those glimpses, not just through actual like historical events, but through the lens of just a, a family nucleus where where you can kind of jump uh, back and forth in time simply through through these characters having to contend with their their own histories and there's something in there that i feel is so rich that you know you could also you know much like you said with some of these things that you're fascinated about you could write for 40 pages you know i feel like if you start to let yourself go with family history you could go for dozens and dozens of pages without having any plot you know by just trying to to really look at at, at the history of these people because we're so complex uh, so yeah, I, I think families is crucial for a lot of these narratives, especially when looking at history and politics and you know culture. So uh, it's yeah, a way to well, ground it all. Yeah, there's a way that somehow you know when you're looking at countries that have these huge upheavals like you know Cuba, like the Philippines, or these massive political um, cataclysms, for lack of a better term. It's almost like you can't look at it and get a sense of it. So, you know, it's like, well, if you want to get a sense of the wind, if you're watching wind out a window, you watch the grass, right? You don't watch the wind. So it's like watching these families, it's kind of like watching the grass. You can see what exactly the big force, um, what happened, what the big force does that is understandable um, in a human register. I just want to jump in really quick here and just uh, remind people that you you have the option. This is a really incredible opportunity to ask a question um, in the Q and A thing if you want to do that. 
And also I just posted the, the link to, to buy both of these incredible novels. The novels are The Playwright's House by Dariel Suarez and The Human Zoo by Sabina Murray. And this is just a fascinating conversation. I don't wanna get in your way anymore. Um, I do have a little question though. Um, uh, there is a, let's see if I can find this quote. There's a really interesting um, post and sort of an influential post that, that was posted a couple of weeks ago by um, a, short, a fiction writer named Brandon Taylor. And he wrote something about moral fiction, which I think is an interesting thing to consider given both of the topics of both of your books. He said, moral does not mean good or lawful. Moral means true. Moral means you take your finger off the scale. To make moral art, moral fiction is to get out of the way. To make moral art is to admit one's humble place in the order of things. I think moral fiction is less about signaling to the reader that you voted for the right people or that you're able to listen to people who you would have destroyed, who would have you destroyed. Moral fiction does not single, signal. That is propaganda. That is social work. Not that these are unimportant things, but they are not art and they are not moral. And I just wondered, I thought that was a very interesting take on, on, on fiction. And I wonder what you guys think about that in the context of these novels. Yeah, well, you know, okay, I completely agree with that. Um, in order to write a moral novel, you really can't go out there and expect to look good, which I think you would think that what you want to do is like, you know, like, yeah, me virtue signaling, look at my like completely awesome, you know, correct novel. No, I mean, what happened with me is I, when I wrote this, and I'm not giving any spoilers in the book, I created what I think Ting is one of the most infuriating characters out there because she's super smart. She's super aware. She thinks, she thinks that she's on the right side of everything, but she is just an incredibly frustrating person. She doesn't take a stand. She doesn't feel she has to. She has no sense of proportion. She's like, I should really save the country and my friends, but I have to go to dinner with my aunt. So it's going to have to wait. And she's like that. And a lot of people, when they read the book, are like, ah, you know, I even get that, you know, you have that, what is the good reason for me? Like, why is this character so maddening to drive me crazy? I did that because I wanted people to be like maddened and aggravated by the situation in the Philippines. And I wanted them to read the book and be like, ah. And in the end, you know, it, it makes sense. The book does make sense. I didn't just try to annoy people to pieces. She's kind of intriguing in her maddeningness. But I think that that ties in with the moral fiction. Because for me, I wanted people to care. From my moral standpoint, I wanted people to care. And because of that, I couldn't write a character who was a stand-in for all the good, the goodness that other people might imagine that they themselves would do in that situation. So anyway, that's just, that's part of it. I think that taking the finger off the scales and representing the book and the reality and not representing yourself as a moral human being or trying to win mm -hmm. by writing, you know, the book that puts you in the best regard with your readership. I think, I think maybe I agree with that. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I do too. And I, and I, I love the way that Taylor put it. Um, um, it feels sort of, uh, it, it feels very, um, I don't know, sort of implying a lot of layers as well, because, you know, it's separating the, the ideal of moral or morality from the way that we think of it as, for instance, my characters, I, I want my characters to be as morally compromised as possible. Um, uh, you know, that's, that's where the good stuff is, you know, I don't want my characters to be just one side or the other, I want to be able to understand all of them, even the quote unquote antagonists and in a story. Um, the reason why when they're well rendered, we tend to even gravitate or find them interesting is because they highlight and they illuminate things that um, sometimes even the protagonist really can't. And, uh, and then when Sabine is talking about, you know, her protagonist, you know, my protagonist is the same way. It's like it's sort of neutral in the beginning and sort of uh, as bland as, as, you know, as, you know, a main character could be without, you know, and, and I knew that going in, I was trying to see if I could sort of change some of that as, as a story evolved. But uh, but I also think that as a writer, I do feel like our sensibilities and our perspectives are going to find their way into our work. And I think there's no way to really avoid that. And I don't know that we should resist that. Like, I, I agree that we shouldn't take, I don't think my job as a fiction writer is to take a stance or to tell you what to think. Uh, that is propaganda in a way. Um, but I do think that uh, to take too much of a neutral position of any kind with all your characters or your, your story in general, 
can lead to a very bland place and can also lead to places that, that ignored a lot of things. So if I'm staring at the history of Cuba uh, and I choose to look into its violent history or into its political oppressive history, uh, that is a choice I'm making as a writer and it, it implies a, a particular position or, or at least uh, the kinds of questions that I'm asking. But I also see that as, as, as a truth that needs to be written and explored. And um, then through the characters, you can interrogate as much of it as possible and show that not everybody thinks the same, that not everybody feels the same way. Uh, and that's where you can complicate and get it again into these morally, more morally compromised positions where there's a lot of hubris and a lot of irony and contradiction. Um, and I think that's where the good stuff is in fiction. But so all to say that, yes, I, I agree that ultimately our job as fiction writers is to uh, to really go into all these layered areas and to not have to give the reader a particular, you know, hey, here's my argument and I want you to be convinced by it and I want you to agree with me. Um, but I do think that we also shouldn't resist the idea that we have chosen a topic and a place and a people and a perspective or a number of perspectives for a reason, you know, and and that leaning into that can actually illuminate a lot of other things. As long, as long as we're not getting in our own way and in our character's way, and we're not forcing our characters to just be like, you know, mouthpieces for a perspective and there are actual people with, with you know, the one opinion here, another opinion there and, and an action that contradicts that opinion, et cetera. Then I think that's where you could really sort of get into the interesting parts of, of fiction. So, so yeah, I, I agree. I, again, I just, sometimes I do think that we emphasize too much this idea that the novelists should completely stay out of the way because I understand what that means. But if I completely did that, I might not have an interesting story to tell. And so, you know, that's that's where the line for me becomes a little bit tricky. Uh, and I don't mind writers leaning into into particular places as long as you're not imposing, you know, a singular sort of opinion. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I really, I, I, go ahead, Sabina, go ahead. Well, I just think that the political novel, you know, we're talking about moral novels we're talking about taking a stand without overshadowing your characters or dulling down the, the characters in order to make the mouthpieces, that's your term. But I also think that political novels are just hugely important for getting people to care about populations that, you know, I mean, novels are a way of getting people to care about people who don't exist. But some of these people who don't exist kind of stand in for people who do exist and they stand in for people you should care about and whose truth deserves to be known. So I also think that even, you know, even when you're writing these kind of morally ambiguous novels that writing a political novel about something that you care about or a history that you care about is, an, is kind of a moral act. So interesting. I mean, I love, I, I've never really heard um... I heard the distinction made that you guys, both of you just, just did. It's very interesting. I think it's, it's really true. And I, I, I know for in Dario's novel that um, the protagonist, the, the sort of moral position of the protagonist and the way that he, you know, and, and his, he, he is morally compromised and he, you know, he struggles with that internally. And that is one of the major driving factors in the novel or was for me. It was sort of like, oh, how's he going to resolve this? So, yeah. So it, go, it goes back to craft, I guess, too. It's a sort of internal conflict that a protagonist can have that can really drive things along. Yeah, and can I, can I ask you a question, uh, so Sabina? I'm, so one thing that I, you know, I've, I think with practice and time, I've, I've gotten better at navigating, but I also think that it's, we're human beings as novelists. We're not just <laughs> defined as, you know, just being writers. We're, we're people in the world. We engage emotionally, intellectually with the places that we write about, the people that we write about. And as you mentioned, writing a political novel in a way is to give voice as well. And there is a certain moral responsibility or whatever one might want to call it that, that might come sort of with the territory there. Uh, personally, you know, I, you know, when I'm thinking about Cuba and the reason I decided to write about Cuba in, in my first two books is that, I, you know, it's my native country, but beyond that, it's a place that I love and a place that stirs up a lot of different complex emotions in me, um, both because of you know, my experiences while I was there and my relationship to it now. But then in choosing to write about it, especially through fiction, you know, there's still that sort of, you know, maybe it is a moral question of like, am I staying out of my own way? Am I sort of like infusing too much of my own sensibility into this in a way that, um, is the best thing for, for the story. So I guess I'm sort of turning my own sort of statement that I said before to only tell a little bit and trying to interrogate, 
is there anything as you're writing for you on the personal end that you might wrestle with uh, in the choices that you're making either for your characters or for the context that you include or the perspective that you might want to uh, inhabit in the, in the book? And how do you know, navigate that as an artist? You know, when, when do you separate yourself, the human being, the person who has very strong, you know, maybe has very strong opinions or feelings about something versus the vehicle for these characters to try to get all this information and, and do it in a compelling way and in a seductive way to a reader. So is, there, is that something that ever crosses your mind that you struggle with? And I wonder if, uh, yeah, how you, how you work with that. Well, it's, it's, I worry, I mean, you wonder all the time and you wonder about how to create a compelling story and at some point, the story becomes becomes bigger than you as a writer, and then your characters don't behave anymore. And that's when I know I'm writing a novel. And you're laughing because you know I mean, you both have, you're both laughing because you're both writers, and you know what I'm talking about. It's that point at which you sit down and you start writing, and you're like, okay, you're going here, and you're going to do this, and you're going to feel that way, and then you two are going to fall in love, and then and then your characters just revolt, and they just start doing what the novel needs them to do. So, so much of it is just listening to the book in a weird way. I mean, now I sound like I'm, you know, I'm like, and then I take my crystal and I light my candle, but there is something very weird that happens. Um, and your characters don't, don't obey. And then you have to start listening to what they do or what they want to do um, and how they're evolving on the page and what their um, motivations are. I mean, to me, that's, to, to some degree, you become very, you start out having to feel like, you know, having to have this massive ego that you would even think for a minute you could write this thing that someone else is going to read and take hours and hours reading. I mean, it's like you, I mean, we have to be egomaniacs, like to think that that is something that we can do. And yet we do it. And then about halfway through the book, you become incredibly humbled and you're like, oh my God, I don't even like this book. How could anybody else like this book? Like, I hate this thing. I hate all of you. You're terrible characters and the story's ridiculous. And then you come out of that again. So that's not a very direct answer to the question, but I think you get so beaten up in the, pro pro um, in the process of writing a novel that a lot of this stuff just almost just works itself out. Whether you want to work, have it worked out or not, whether you feel in control, there's something in the process. I don't know, what do you guys think? Daryl, what happens to you when you're writing? Does that happen, anything like that? Do I sound insane? I might, I might just be crazy. No, not at all. It, it helps a lot when the characters are real people and they become real people in a sense to you, right? That's the way that I think of it. It's, you know, when, when all the characters have their own power, their own energy and, and they're arguing between themselves and I'm just the vehicle for which, you know, through which that happens versus me trying to do that. I think that does save you sort of more peace of mind that the, the, the story and the characters sort of leading the way and dictating a lot of these things and things you hadn't planned for or things that you, or, or changes you have to make because all of a sudden you realize this is, this is not what the characters want uh, and not what the story needs. Uh, it does help sort of mitigate some of that. I think the frustration also comes from um, the fact that there's two things I think I play off, oftentimes in the middle of, you know, that, that crisis moment of like being humbled by the process. And one is, I think that, you know, as I think as Sadie Smith said, like every, every novel is a beautiful failure and that, you know, if you're lucky, like 70% of what's in your head makes it onto the page, you know, and at most. And, and I think that we know that, you know, as we're writing, we know that whatever it's in our heads, it's probably working a lot better than what ultimately we can read <laughs> that we've written. So there's that struggle of like, how do I make this interesting? How do I make this engaging? How do, is, is anybody gonna care? Uh, and, and also we get to see the mechanics of it, right? We, we have to engage with them, even in the revision process. That's why I feel a lot of writers don't like revising. It's because a lot of it, it's not that it's work and going over the same thing because I personally don't mind that if I'm fascinated by, by characters and a topic, I like being with them, but I understand the mechanics to some extent, you know, as I'm revising the structure of the dialogue, I'm controlling things to some extent, even if the characters are leading the way, I'm still trying to make sure that it makes sense, that it flows, that it, it does all the things that are, so that the reader doesn't notice the mechanics, hopefully as much. And I think that also takes away some of the magic. And I think that for me, 
that is why I think the difference between reading a book and versus writing it is that you know when when writing is really working and you're really feeling it and the characters are going on on their own and you have that scene that you finish and you're like man that that really was great that is a great feeling but the opposite of that it's like trying to make that scene work and fit and you know and and you're trying to move the you know the mechanics around and and then it loses its magic in a way or it can um, and so you kind of have to learn to nerd out on the craft part to to sort of not lose hope and still trust that the reader would just go through the scene or go through whatever it is and you know come out the other side uh, you know compelled and, and and still interested and engaged and uh so anyway yeah it's uh yeah i don't know we, it's it's a lot of ego and also a lot of delusion and a lot of uh just like i believe that for whatever reason this might work in the end and i'm i'm gonna spend years working on this thing and see what happens it's uh takes a lot of commitment, I think, to do that. Yeah, it's sometimes the hardest thing is getting somebody from one side of a room to the other. I don't know, like you, you can lose a day to doing that. Um, yeah, definitely. And a whole lot of editing. I tend to lose 25% of my book in the edit, sometimes more. I mean, there's a sense of, what I'm getting from both, what both of you are saying is that there's a sense in which being a novelist, I mean, I'm, I'm going to go back to your crystals here, Sabina, that there's a sense in which being a novelist is, is, is like channeling in a sense. I mean, which is why, which is one reason that, that I feel like, and Dario mentioned ego, and, and in some ways it's, it's just a question of getting the ego out of the way and, and opening yourself to be able to channel the story and these characters that are, that are out there that you're sort of a, become the spokesman for, the, you become the, the puppet master for whatever. But yeah, there's a sense of when, 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 when you are channeling rather than directing, that tends to, it, for me, and, that, and to what you said, Dario, too, about not minding revision. For me, it's this, this re-inhabiting a story like that is really, that's part of the fun. It's like, okay, what are they gonna do now? You know, how's this gonna shape up? So, well, I mean, I think any, any final words? I, we didn't have any questions from the audience, which is okay. It's the end of the day and everybody's tired. It's, you know, and everything like that. Um, but this is, for me, this has just been an incredibly fascinating conversation. Uh, I'm gonna leave you guys with the last word, but before I do that, I wanna just say, um, go to bookshop.org or your, your regular bookstore and buy both of these novels, The Playwright's House by Dario Suarez and The Human Zoo by Sabina Murray. Fantastic, incredible novels that will, you know, make you appreciate the world that we live in more and people that you may not know and, and cultures and countries that you may not know because these are fabulous books. Um, I'm going to leave it to you guys to sort of take us out. We, we have a couple minutes. Maybe you guys, maybe each of you could say one final thing. I don't know if you have something. Well, I just, I just want to say that I'm, I've really enjoyed this conversation with Daryl and Tim. This has been great fun. Um, I really think that, you know, there was so much to talk about because we have a lot of overlap in what we're writing about, but a lot of different things too. Um, and I hope you do check out our books because, you know, if nothing else, it'll take you somewhere. You're not in the U.S. It'll take you somewhere else. You might learn something and, you know, you'll at least be in a very warm climate. Um, so, and thank you to uh, the festival for inviting me and thanks guys for a great conversation. Um, and I hope we can do it in person sometime soon. Yes, I know. Yeah, me too. Thank you, everybody. And, uh, and I wanted to th uh, thank you, Sabina, for, for writing political fiction. I, I you know, I've, Tim knows this about me. Like I'm a big advocate for international and, and political fiction. I, I sort of read uh, more work in translation usually than than even work written in, in the US. Uh, and the reason for that is that there is such a big history of political fiction out there. And um, and I just, I don't know, I feel like I'm sort of an advocate for, for readers engaging with that a lot more because the novels are fun, they're engaging, they have high stakes, uh, but they also can, can teach you things about the world uh, that aren't just things you hold in your head, but things that can actually influence the way that you think about uh, people, the way that you engage with the world, even if you're in your own community or in your own family, et cetera. And so I just feel like, you know, it's important to give voice, like you said earlier, Sabina, to, to particular parts of the world that, that aren't always considered, um, or at least not looked at with nuance, you know? And so to me, that's where the political novel can really do a lot of work uh, so that it isn't just about stereotypes. It isn't just about the things you've heard. Yeah. It's like, let me dig into it and, and come out richer and entertain and engage and all of those things. So thank you for doing that work because it's, it's good work and, and I wish more people did it. <laughs> and, and you too.
we're doing it together. I know there are more people out there, but I really do, just in terms of getting nuanced, kind of in-depth voices rather than just outside voices. It helps to have some inside voices there. Well, thank you so much for your, your wisdom and your creativity. And we wish uh, both of these novels every success. And uh, don't forget, everybody go out and buy the novels. And thank you for attending the Brattleboro Literary Festival. We have one more day, so enjoy it. Really great to see you too. Good luck. Good Bye. Writing. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank you Bye. all. Bye.